Donald Edward Holt was born in Sydney on the 5th of August 1908. He was one of the two sons of the Holt family. Olive May is his mother's name and Thomas James Holt is his father's name. In his younger years, he attended the Randwick Public School until 1916 where he was sent to the countryside to his grandparents, and he attended the Nuba State School for his brief time there. He returned to Sydney the next year and attended Abbott's Home College for three years. Holt then began boarding at Wesley College in Melbourne, 1920, and in his final years, he got a scholarship. He set his eyes on law, and in 1927 he began studying it at the University of Melbourne, and in 1930 he got his Bachelor of Laws degree. Holt passed the Victorian Bar Exam in 1932 and went on to practice as a barrister in Melbourne. He became a member of the United Australia Party, Australia's main conservative party at the time, where his skills were put on a spotlight, with the party's leaders acknowledging his talent to become a candidate for the elected office position. While in UAP, he met Robert Menzies, and with their shared interest, the two quickly became friends. On the 7th of April, 1939, the then-acting Prime Minister, Joseph Lyons, suddenly died of a heart attack. They needed a new replacement for the position, and so the party chose Robert Menzies. Menzies' term gave Holt a rise to the office, with him being appointed as a minister. But Menzies' reputation among the party was getting low, and so, in 1941, Menzies was forced to retire as the Prime Minister. This, however, didn't stop Holt in his career in politics. When the United Australia Party dissolved in 1944, he then joined a new party created by his friend Menzies called the Liberal Party. Menzies led the party to victory in 1949. Inside the party, Holt was one of the most prestigious members, and because of this, he assumed a variety of government positions such as Minister for Labour, Immigration and National Service. And in 1958, he replaced Arthur Fadid as treasurer, until in 1966, when Menzies stepped down as the Prime Minister, and on the 26th of January 1966, Holt was sworn in as the 17th Prime Minister of Australia, but his stay at this position wouldn't last that long. At 11.30 a.m., Harold Holt arrived in Melbourne. He first went to his office and then to his home at St. George's Rotorac. He ate a meal for a while, then, at 1.15 p.m., he hopped in his red Pontiac Parisian to drive to his Portsea residence. While on the way to Portsea, he stopped by the Johnson's Fish Store in Sorrento to buy a fish. While there, he saw a familiar face. Mrs. Marjorie Pamela Gillespie, who is also buying a fish. They talked for a while and made arrangements to visit the Gillespie household. At 6.45 p.m. that day for some drinks, he agreed and went on to their residence. He had a drink with Mr. and Mrs. Gillespie, 
His stay there was just a short one hour Until he went home After getting home He went to have a dinner with Mrs. Lawless And after that, he went to bed At approximately 9.30 p.m. He woke up early, had breakfast, did some gardening, and then he called his stepson, Nicholas MacDonald Fairholt, to invite him to Porty, in which Nicholas agreed to. In the afternoon, he went to visit the home of Dr. Bruce Condal Edwards at Sorrento. There, he played tennis with the company of Dr. Edwards, Winton Gillespie, Walter Bistarman, Mary Griffin, Roy Snepfine, and other people. Dr. Edwards stated that Holt played two sets of tennis in the afternoon. He remarked that Holt was happy and enjoyed his time playing the game. Although noting that Holt did not play to his usual self, Dr. Edwards then speculated that it was due to the shoulder injury Holt had suffered from playing football in his early life, in which he received treatment from a doctor named Dr. John Cloak. At about 5 p.m. he arrived at his home. One and a half hour later, he, along with Nicholas and his wife, went to attend a wedding anniversary at the home of Mr. Steve Martin. They stayed there for about one hour until they went home. At home, he hosted a dinner party with about 14 guests. The guests consisted of neighbors and their family. Holt was noted for being in very good spirits and enjoying the dinner. After that, Nicholas, his wife, and Holt went to their neighbor's house next door, named Mr. John Edgar. They stayed for the remainder of the evening there, enjoying stereo music. Nicholas and his wife left before Holt. And at last, he went home and slept the night. At 6.30 in the morning, Holt woke up and visited the kitchen. He spoke to Mrs. Lawless about his request for a breakfast consisting of orange juice, toast, and a tea. She took up the request and delivered it to his room. Mrs. Lawless described him being in good spirits and in his usual self. At 9 a.m. in the mid-morning, he left to drive to the local general store. There, he bought some insect repellent, peanuts, and the Sydney Sunday papers. Coincidentally, one of the headlines of the newspaper, the Australian to be exact, had the headline of DM advised to swim less. Which talked about Holt's doctor advising him to avoid overworking his physical strength and to lessen his swimming and tennis activities. It is not known whether he read or even saw the paper. After returning home, he informed Mrs. Lawless that he would leave later to watch the solo circumnavigator, Alec Rose, in his vessel, called the Lovely Lady, pass through the rip into Port Phillip Bay. He stayed in his garden with his grandchild, Sophie, and talked to the son of his neighbor, Jonathan Edgar, about spearfishing and the crayfish they had speared last week together. They made an arrangement to go spearfishing again at around 4 p.m. that afternoon at the Cheviot Beach, also known as the Back Beach Quarantine Station. During the morning, he called up his neighbor Mrs. Gillespie on the phone to tell her that he was planning to go to the old fort and ask her if there is anyone from her family that would like to join him and later for them to go to the quarantine back beach. 
it was planned that he would be calling for them at the Gillespie residence at 11 a.m. But Holt was late, and at about 11.30 a.m., they were off with the convoy of two cars. The first car, a white Holden station wagon, was driven by Alan Stewart with Vinner Gillespie and Martin Simpson as his passengers. The second car, a maroon-colored Pontiac, was driven by Holt with Mrs. Gillespie as his passenger. They traveled until at the main gate of the quarantine station. Holt spoke with the military guard Private Peter William Morgan. He told him about his identity and the guard let them in. They watched as the barely visible vessel Lively Lady passed the rip into Port Phillip Bay. After this, they went back to their cars, and so they went to the beach. The time was around 12.15 p.m. They laid their belongings on the sand, where they also just chatted for a while. One of their topics was the condition of the beach and the surf at the time. Mrs. Gillespie was quoted saying, The surf was higher than I'd ever seen it, and it was a full tide, but not unduly rough at this stage. The sea beyond where it was breaking appeared to be calm. Mr. Stewart was quoted saying, I noticed that the tide was very high, and the surf was very turbulent. In fact, the biggest I've ever seen on that beach. Martin Simpson was quoted saying, So, I went into the water almost knee deep, and there was a fairly strong undercurrent. So I just splashed around without going in too far. Holt mentioned, I know this beach like the back of my head. And he then went on to say that the tide was unusually high. After the conversation, the group went on their separate ways. With Mrs. Gillespie wandered along the beach towards the end in the direction of Portsea. Martin Simpson and Vinner Gillespie headed to the direction Mrs. Gillespie took. Alan Stewart walked to the edge of the water to feel the water's temperature. Holt went towards the water, he went in a diagonal fashion, and swam without hesitation away from the beach. Mrs. Gillespie returned just after Holt entered the water. Stewart returned to where Mrs. Gillespie was sitting besides their belongings. He said to her, If Mr. Holt can take it, I had better go in too. He then entered the water, stayed close to the shore, because of the deep pool and the very strong undertow around his legs. He continued to swim in the area, and while swimming around, he noticed that Holt was swimming further to the sea silently. He noticed that Holt was swimming in what he thinks is a dangerous turbulence. He saw Mrs. Gillespie on the edge of the water, looking at where Holt was seen, and so he joined her. But shortly before Alan Stewart left the water, she was looking for Holt and had noticed him swimming well. But getting further and further away into the sea, and the violent waves kept hitting him until the waves ate him. Mrs. Gillespie describes it as Like a leaf being taken out. So quick and final. After this, Harold Edward Holt was never seen again. Stuart got up to Mrs. Gillespie, so he joined her in search of Holt. With no results, Stuart left the water to a rock, where he can take up a vantage point. They were later joined by Simpson and Vinner Gillespie. After searching for a while, they discussed that the situation had become dire, and it was decided that Stuart would call for help. Stuart then quickly ran back to their car and started driving back to the gate. On his way, he overtook 
two vehicles while over speeding and nearly threw one of the cars off the cliff. At approximately 12.45 p.m., Stewart arrived at the gate. He parked the car, and while doing this, he was spoken to by one of the passengers he overtook. The man said, Hey, watch your speed! He disregarded it and ran off towards the army guard. He saw the army guard on duty named Morgan and told him, We have a reason to believe that the Prime Minister, Mr. Holt, is in difficulties, as he went swimming and has not been sighted owing to the very big surf. Can I speak to your officer in a hurry? Morgan then went to the switchboard and spoke to Captain Juman. He explained to him what was happening and gave the phone to Stuart. Stuart then talked to Schumann with one of his requests. I want a helicopter as soon as possible. Schumann then instructed Stuart to stay where he was and told him that he should contact the T-24 to tell them what was happening. Schumann then left to the beach while gathering people on his way. After talking to Captain Schumann, Morgan then contacted the T-24 communication center. He explained the situation along with Stuart. However, while Stuart was talking on the phone, two men from the car that Stuart nearly threw off the cliff while over speeding, named Corporal Neville Woods and John Haywood, entered the office. The officer in the T-24 requested for Stuart to stay at the gate where they had spoken. After he hung up, Woods asked Stuart, What was your hurry? Is there something wrong? Stuart then replied, Yes, Mr. Holt is in difficulties, and I want to contact spotter planes and an ambulance. Woods also told him that he has a pair of binoculars and he would go looking for Holt. After this, he instructed his friends John Haywood and Neville Lynch to go to Sorrento and grab some diving equipment as he went to the hill overlooking the beach and scanning the area. In a blowhole pool, he noticed something pink in the waters but he couldn't discern what it was and kept looking. He then saw Mrs. Gillespie, Linda Gillespie, and Martin Simpson. They were on their way towards the hill, but occasionally looked at the beach and stopped sometimes to look at the sea. When they got closer to him, he asked for some information about Holt's disappearance. Because Mrs. Gillespie was too upset about the situation, he asked her daughter, Linda Gillespie, where they had last seen him. She pointed to the blowhole where he had seen something pink. John Haywood and Neville Lynch then arrived carrying diving equipment, and the three of them went out to the beach to look for Holt. After arriving at the beach, Woods recalled what the beach condition was like. Uh, the water was dirty, it was difficult to see, and the undertow was extremely strong. We were just getting pushed backwards and forwards by the waves, and the undertow was trying to pull us into the channel and out to the sea. It was too rough to be able to search properly. The tide had only just gone on the turn. After leaving the water, they went up a big rock and used a binoculars to search the area. The Port Sea Life Saving Group then arrived at the entrance gate and Stuart left with them to Cheviot Beach. On the beach, he saw Mrs. Gillespie near Holt's car. Then he drove Mrs. Gillespie, Linda Gillespie, and Martin Simpson return home, but after this, he went back to the beach so he could assist with the rescue operations. Captain Schumann arrived and talked to Stuart for a while, and went off to the beach along with two swimmers and three observers he gathered. At the beach, he organized the men to their respective positions. 
the swimmers in the water and observers at the cliff top then borrowed the binoculars from Neville Woods and went on to the cliff to get a better view. After some time, Schumann left the beach and went back to the officer's mess to first set up a control center headquarters. He carried this out until the arrival of the police and other public utility to take over the search. Back at the beach, more divers arrived. They had safety lines, but quickly realized that the water condition was too violent. So they surfaced back to the shore and waited until the condition improved. When the tides went down, the divers plunged into the water with their equipment, but with no success. At 2.30 p.m., a man named Lawrence James Newell arrived at the officer cadet school. He was assigned to help with the police search party at the scene of the incident. After arriving, he again boarded the helicopter and flew to the beach, where he interviewed Stuart. After hearing his story, he again entered the helicopter to search the area. He was later joined by other helicopters. Superintendent Hill from the P District then came and assumed command, while Newell acted as his second in command. Four personnel from the police search and rescue squad then arrived at the scene, along with some civilian divers. They dove and searched underwater, but were heavily impeded by the strong sea force. Several boats came to help with the search. The boats included one boat from the police motor boat squad, a lifeboat from Queenscliff, and several privately owned boats. At 5 p.m., a boat overturned. The three passengers were thrown into the water. One of them managed to swim to a lifeboat. However, the two men left in the sea were pushed by the waves towards some serrated rocks where they would sustain severe injuries. However, the pilot of the TAA helicopter rescued the men under very difficult circumstances. By the night, with no progress to locate Holt's body, the search activity were reduced to just a military personnel patrolling the Cheviot beach to the adjacent beaches and a naval boat in standby and searching with a spotlight. At 8 p.m., a conference attended by the parties involved in the search were held and agreed to these arrangements. For the police to continue as the coordinator of the operations, these were performed by Superintendent Hill and Inspector Newell. The army patrols to search the beaches in both Port Phillip Bay and Bay Strait starting at 4.52 a.m. December 18th. St. John Ambulance and Fire Brigade to patrol and search the beach in both Port Phillip Bay and Bay Strait, east of the Army area. Helicopter patrols to search the beaches, both inside and outside of the heads, as far afield as Port Arlington, Anglesey, Cape Shank, and Mount Martha. Naval and police boats to search the sea surface of Bay Strait, with lighter boats inshore and larger ones further out. Naval and police underwater search personnel to carry out detailed and coordinated search of the Cheviot Beach area. A coordination center for police and all other communications to be set up at Cheviot Hill. Army to assist with supply of quarters and rations to all persons employed in operation. At 9 p.m., a press conference was held, and the press were made aware of these arrangements. 
at the first light of December 18th, those plans were initiated. The rescue mission on the first day built up to about 190 personnel were engaged in the search from the following authorities. Several people from the beach patrols at both Port Phillip Bay and Bay Strait Coast reported seeing an object similar to a body floating offshore. Helicopters and boats were dispatched to take a look at the object. However, the object were eliminated as a body. The beach was visited by the Chief Commissioner of Police. Assistant Commissioner, the Acting General Officer, Commanding Southern Command, Brigadier Colwell, Commodore Downson of the Navy, and Mrs. Holt. The visibility conditions on the beach, sea, and air were harsh due to the rough seas and heavy surf. A bunch of kelp also confused the search and helicopters were not allowed to fly because of the rain and high wind speeds estimating over 50 knots. In the late afternoon, an officer in charge of naval operations, Commander Hudson, talked to a professional fisherman, H. Matchmore, who is well versed in the local sea conditions about the local sea activity. A secretary of the Port Phillip Sea Pilots, Captain J. Barclay, and a board of works engineer, Mr. Barnes, both researched the sea activity and assessed where Holt's body would be likely carried. The following arrangements were created by a conference about the plan for the following day. Beach patrol to continue overnight and again on December 19th. Helicopter search to continue to cover the coast and give special attention to search the rip and the north and south approaches. Boat patrol at the south end of the bay to continue and to move later near the waters of Bay Strait. Diving operations to continue moving towards Point Nepean Heads from Cheviot Bay. The day was uneventful, other than the important eyewitness Stewart getting injured in a motorcycle accident. At 8 p.m., a planning conference was held, and it was decided that a joint operation of the police and military would be implemented. It also made plans for the following day. Foot patrols by army personnel to cover the beaches and search the beaches around Point Nepean and Cheviot Bay, both inside and outside the heads as tides recede for naval and police divers to continue searching, moving gradually towards Point Nepean. Helicopter patrols cover the same areas as before and to move towards Cape Shank and Rosebud, in and outside the bay, and also the areas around Point Lonsdale. As the weather conditions were getting better since the initial search had begun, the helicopter patrols were exceptional at covering a lot of area to search. A joint survey by helicopter was made up of a police officer in charge and the commanding officer of the military to search at several locations on the beach between Point Nepean and Cape Shank, where accumulation of driftwood and other floating objects were observed. At 3.42 p.m., a message was received from D-24 that a report had been received by the telephone that someone saw a body on the rocks of Victory Shoal near Queenscliff. The location was immediately investigated, 
but the rock in question was not even above the water at the time, and it was ruled out that the call was a hoax. With the better weather conditions, it enabled a joint operation from the police and navy diving teams, with the help of a helicopter observing from above. A minesweeper support ship named the HMAS Snipe was planned to arrive in the area to provide naval support. The plans for December 21 were as follows. Navy to search at sea with HMAS Snipe. Royal Australian Air Force helicopter to search east as far as Inverloch. And in addition to continue close beach patrols, Civilian helicopters to assist with close beach patrols. Army patrols to continue on local beaches. Police and Navy diving teams to carry out the final phase of underwater search. Several objects were sighted and investigated, but were all eliminated as Holt's body. HMAS Snipe arrived in the area and stayed in base trades to support the search and air rescue if such an occasion arose. Searches by the beach were again done with no results. Naval divers withdrew but retained some police divers in the area if they were needed. The same plan used on December 21st was planned again for the next day. At 8 a.m., the police headquarters and other associated branches were all moved to Jarman Field to be more efficient. A discussion with the squadron leader of the Royal Australian Air Force phased out four helicopters of the search operations and were then sent back to their respective base. The helicopters use and sycamore that had been provided by J. Rose Motors also ceased operations the next day. The ship HMAS Snipe also returned to its base in Sydney. The Army Beach Patrol still continued with their previously scouted locations. The base strait was extremely calm and so, the following day, the police diving team resumed operations and completely eliminated the possibility of the body being lodged in the underwater crevices. The search continued with only beach patrols and helicopter surveys until its termination on January 3, 1968. Approximately 200 to 250 hours of flight time were allowed and the massive search effort was participated by a maximum of 300 personnel. Even with the large search effort, Holt's corpse was never found. So discerning what had happened at his final fate will be a mystery. However, that won't stop us to speculate what had happened. We need to first explore the evidence related to the accident, as well as some theories and other information that can help us puzzle out what had transpired and contributed to Holt's disappearance. First, how did Holt die? Well, considering that the accident had taken place in a dangerous beach, at the wrong time with western winds and ebb tides, creating violent waves and strong undertow, drowning is the most likely cause of his death. As to how he drowned, he might have gotten it in the head by a strong wave or a driftwood struck him, rendering him unconscious and subsequently drowning. 
this is supported by the strong waves at the time. But Mrs. Gillespie said before losing sight of Holt and the abundance of driftwood at Cheviot Beach at the time. Medical complications could also be the case. Holt could have suffered a heart attack or got exhausted while swimming and drowned. Holt also suffered from a shoulder injury from his youth playing football, so it could also play a part. There are also theories of suicide, but people close to Holt before his disappearance have said that there wasn't anything unusual about his behavior in the days leading up to the accident. Holt's physician, Dr. Marcus Delon, once said, At the time I examined Mr. Holt last on Friday, the 15th of December, 1967, there was no reason, either physical or mental, that could cause or contribute to his death under normal circumstances. Marine life could also play a part, since Australia have such a diverse nature made demons. He could have been stung by a jellyfish, which would incapacitate him, or he got attacked and eaten by sharks. Holt had swam Cheviot Beach before, in fact, it was one of his favorite places to dive and spearfish in because of its caves and limestone holes. This isn't also the first time he drowned. On May 22, 1967, again at Cheviot Beach, he drowned and nearly died because of his faulty snorkel that made him struggle for air and ingest water but he was saved by his companions. People close to Holt, especially those that dove and spearfished with him, have said that his underwater endurance is terrific and his knowledge of the beach was coded. Mr. Holt had a more detailed knowledge underwater of Cheviot Beach than any other swimmer I knew. As for his body, there are two main theories for the failure to find his remains. First, marine life could have consumed his body. Such prime suspects are zealises, crayfish, sharks, and others. As Dr. James McNamara, a pathologist with a familiarity of the area and experience from bodies recovered in the area in the past, he concluded, I would expect the body of Mr. Holt, if freed to rise, would have arisen within a 20 to 48 hour period and floated. If not freed to rise and subjected to attack by sea lice, the body would have been reduced to a skeleton in a period as short as 24 to 48 hours. Second, a survey report made by Arthur H. Lucas. If his body did float, then the body might possibly went to these three different scenarios. His body could have floated along the beaches towards Port Phillip Bay entrance in the rock area of the Cheviot Beach. But this area was already searched as humanly as possible, or his body would have floated in an easterly direction. The floating body might have been simply overlooked and sunk into the depths of the ocean. There are also conspiracy theories regarding his disappearance such as CIA assassination, the North Vietnamese killing him with a nerve agent, faking his own death to be with a secret lover, defecting back to China because he's actually a Chinese spy, and other wilder conspiracies. A report conducted by the Joint Operation of the Victoria and Commonwealth Police concluded. During the course of this inquiry, there's been no indication that the disappearance of the late Mr. Holt was anything other than accidental. Despite having a likely conclusion, it will still be a mystery forever because of the insufficient evidence unless we recover his remains.
then the story will be like this in the future. For me, Holt's disappearance is just like any other swimming-related accident. Holt is just one of the hundreds of unfortunate Australians that died due to swimming. It might have been through poor judgment or other various variables or just plain old bad luck. But suddenly disappearing while swimming is unfortunately not that unlikely. Even finding his body is a hard hunt because of the wild sea conditions where he was last seen and the wildlife that might have eaten his remains. It just goes to show you how even the most experienced swimmer and a man with significant status can still be at Mother Nature's mercy 